All right, I think I'll get started. Um, can everyone hear me? Uh, I'm not sure how the mic's working. Yeah? OK, cool. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Wilsius. I'm a product manager on Chrome's uh, graphics team, I guess. And uh, I'm here today to sort of talk about jank on the web, how to fight it, what it is, et cetera. Um, this is sort of a, a variation on a talk I've given a few times before, so some of this may be familiar if you've seen any of that. But uh, I'm also going to talk about some new things, uh, stuff that's recently changed, for instance, in the last few versions of Chrome, and uh, a few things that are happening on the spec front that I think are, are kind of relevant to this discussion. So by way of introduction, you know, if you, if you think about the state of web apps, like, in some ways, it looks a bit bleak, right? Like, the web is not surviving the shift towards mobile computing very gracefully. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this, but one of the big ones is, is kind of performance broadly. But I, th I think it's very helpful to try to specify exactly what we mean when we talk about performance on the mobile web. Um, in, in this talk, I'm going to talk about rendering performance. And specifically, the key thing, the key property of mobile applications that is difficult to achieve in this space is that they animate in response to touch, right? If you want to... Uh, implement the sort of hot UI effect du jour, be it um, sort of a swipe to dismiss style thing, a pull to refresh style thing, or whatever. You want Yelp's little like spaceship takeoff thing when you over scroll, like that's hard to do. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can do that today um, or, or how, how we're sort of evolving along the path towards being able to do that more easily. Um, I think it should be obvious why you should care about this, but just in case you're not, um, this kind of interactivity drives engagement in mobile applications. It's, it's really important that your UI, if you want it to be dynamic and expressive, uh, sort of very fluidly respond to touch input because it keeps some kind of physical metaphor with a touch screen, right? If you put your finger on something and you move it around and you're expecting it to move around, it really needs to stay stuck to your finger. And if you can't, if you can't render at the, at the display's refresh rate, it's not going to feel stuck to your finger. And then all of a sudden the physical metaphor is broken, right? Like you're, you're pushing your finger on the screen and all that's happening is that this thing is kind of lagging and jumping around, right? It, like, it doesn't feel nice. Um, I'm not going to spend any further time on motivation, but I, I think this should be clear. Um, I also think it's helpful before diving into specifics to have like a mental model of sorts of how browser rendering works. Um, way oversimplified, let's, let's call it four steps. There's some JavaScript that runs, and that JavaScript responds to events, and it mutates the DOM's style in some way, maybe mutates the DOM's shape, adds to it, takes it away, whatever. Um, after that, there's style recalculation, which sort of takes the effects of whatever you just changed in JavaScript and propagates it throughout the... the the rest of the DOM tree per CSS, depending on how that goes, maybe you need to relay out uh, a bunch of the bunch of the page. Um, then we need to kind of update where we need to visually update things, which means you need to paint new content. Uh, you don't always need to paint new content, and I'll talk about this more in in a later section. Um, sometimes you just need to maybe reposition something. For instance, if you're scrolling. Um, and then we kind of composite all of the stuff that gets painted into a final screen image. Um, I said this is grossly oversimplified, and I mean, really, it is. Like, it's much. This is this is like a, a view from sort of a, the trace profiler that's built into Chrome. And if if you want your application to be responding to touch input within frame budget, then actually, not only does all this need to happen, but there's a bunch of crap that kind of surrounds all this that needs to happen too. Um, in this image, you can't even see the first thing, which is the, the browser, uh, like not the page, but the browser itself needs to receive the input from the operating system, and it needs to decide what it's going to do with it. For instance, um, like is it going to show the context menu, or is it going to uh, try to determine that, oh, actually, you're doing some sort of complicated gesture, and uh, you know my browser has some UI or UX that's associated with that complicated gesture, et cetera. 
then it gets passed to JavaScript. JavaScript gets to take a crack at this, uh, this touch event that's coming in. Maybe JavaScript decides to do something, at which point the style and layout happens. And then actually in Chrome and in most modern browsers, there's sort of a whole, there's a cleaving in half between what happens in JavaScript's world and what happens in like the painting and compositing world. And everything, like the whole state of the world uh, gets tossed over this boundary from the main JavaScript context area to the compositor thread. And the compositor decides what it's got to repaint and it goes and does that and then it uploads these things to the GPU which takes a certain amount of time that's also not even shown on this complicated graph. And then at some point the GPU needs to actually do some of this work, right? Like we say that modern web browsers are hardware accelerated um, and that's great because they're faster at certain things but it's entirely possible that you could end up bottlenecked there, right? Like the GPU is powerful but it's not like magic. Um, I don't think it's important to really understand like all of this and so I'm not going to talk about it in more detail but, but there's, there's a key concept here that, that I want to try to get across and that's that um, every time we do one of these separations into a different thread, we can cheat a little bit by, by pipelining the system, right? This is bad in some ways because it leads to increased input latency. So if you want to move your finger and uh, there's like pipelining between each of the steps I just talked about, it, it translates to more frames that go by before new pixels show up on the screen. That doesn't feel very good, although it can feel better than actual lower frame rates. Um, but you can't even play that trick with stuff that runs in the main JavaScript thread. Which means that everything I was showing earlier, like uh, JavaScript style layout, these things all run in one place and there's no kind of getting around the fact that if you want to maintain consistent 60 hertz animations, et cetera, all that needs to definitely fit within frame budget. So um, with that as motivation, this talk is really about, about that critical path. It's, it's all the stuff that needs to happen in between when you move your finger on the screen and when new pixels appear. Um, I'm going to do this in two parts. One is about how to handle touch events consistently and effectively, and then the other about how to actually produce those new pixels uh, as cheaply as possible. So first, touch. Uh, but before we do touch, I'm going to do a little aside about like how we got to the state we're in because it, it, it sucks but there are, there are reasons. Um, for all the reasons I was just explaining, like a good GUI needs a UI thread that, that finishes its work in time to make a new frame every 16 milliseconds. 16 milliseconds comes because that's how long you have in between a 60 hertz display refresh. Some displays are faster than that, and if they're faster than that, you have even less time, but most mobile phones, laptops, et cetera, is 60 hertz, so let's just call it 16 milliseconds for now. Um, back in, ye old days of web browsing, um, when we were starting to sort of get off the ground on, on mobile phones, on smartphones, uh, the prospect of having, a, having the main JavaScript thread where style and, and, and JavaScript and layout all ran, um, the prospect of making that fit into this frame budget consistently enough to keep that strong physical metaphor I was talking about earlier when you're doing something as mundane as scrolling the page seemed like not possible. Um, so we compensated by adding this compositor thread that could effectively be the UI thread for the web page. Um, that worked pretty well um, and it only fell over uh, when you sort of needed to get that main thread back involved again. And one of the big cases where you needed to get that main thread back involved again was touch events, because touch events can be prevent defaulted. So uh, the scroll that's supposed to smoothly happen when you put your finger down and uh, drag it up and down the screen would, would have to wait. Like the browser would not do anything. The compositor thread didn't help at all because you needed to wait until JavaScript had a chance to examine this touch input and run its event handler and say, yes, I want to prevent this or no, I don't want to prevent this. Um, this. This effectively undid all the performance benefits of having a compositor thread in the first place and it, it undid it frequently enough that we have this awful touch act timeout thing, which some of you may have encountered and wondered where this came from. Essentially, if JavaScript doesn't 
respond to a touch event within about 200 milliseconds, then um, many browsers, uh, including Chrome, will give up, say, okay, well, you just don't get this touch event then, <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and scroll the page anyway. This sucks because it means that your application can get in this weird state if you did actually wanna prevent that, that touch event. Um, and it, it makes like the whole thing a lot less consistent. Um, you, you really end up with three problems. One, um, after the scrolling starts, uh, Chrome, at least until recently, I'm gonna talk about this more in a second, um, would send you a touch cancel event and you would stop getting touch events, like the rest of the touch event stream for that scroll. Um, this has nasty implications for the kind of UIs you can build. Um, the timeout I was talking about before means that you don't receive these events very reliably, which means it's very difficult to track application state correctly uh, in your web app because there might have been a touch event that happened and you just don't know about it. Um, and lastly, uh, the cleaving in half I talked about earlier means that scroll events aren't really meaningful anymore. Scroll events don't have the same problem that touch events have because scroll events can't be prevent defaulted. Mouse wheel events incidentally can, but we're talking about mobile phones here, so mouse wheel events, I'll sort of leave as an aside. Um, so scroll events can be delivered asynchronously to JavaScript, which means that they can be delivered reliably. We don't have this like act timeout thing, but it means that you might get them very late and by the time you get the scroll event, the screen may actually be like way further on, which means if you wanna do something like reposition some part of your application UI to always be somewhere in response to the, uh, to the position of the scroll offset, for instance, because you're trying to do like a fixed position header yourself in JavaScript or because uh, you're trying to do one of these like fancy parallax scrolling type deals, um, all of a sudden, this like doesn't work very well. Um, some some additional examples of, of what's hard because of this. Um, it's really difficult to do pull to refresh because you need the touch events at the end of the scroll, but not before them, and you don't get them. Um, it's hard to do uh, image carousels uh, very well if you want like the sort of snap point style scrolling. Um, it's hard to do. Uh, this has been in vogue recently, these like hiding navigation bars that scroll off the screen, but then as soon as you try to change the direction of the scroll, they like pop back in. Um, that's like particularly challenging. So, okay, what, what can we do about this? Um, I, I hope I've sort of sufficiently motivated the problem, um, and now I'm gonna talk uh, in a little bit more detail about what we're doing to try to undo this whole mess. Um, I should say that this isn't really related to performance per se, but it's very relevant to jank because if your app can't consistently respond, like receive and respond to these touch events, it, it's gonna feel like jank. It's gonna feel the same way it does if your application just locks up for 100 milliseconds, right? Which is that all of a sudden you'll be dropping frames that should be there in response to some touch move. Um, big old caveat at the beginning, uh, remember what I was talking about about pipelining earlier. If, if you're going to have a mobile application that responds to touch input as its like primary UI mechanism, then you really need to treat the JavaScript main thread as your application's UI thread. Um, if you haven't done other sort of GUI programming in, in, in other systems before, like this may seem like a somewhat foreign concept, and it's especially foreign on the web because you only really have, I mean, workers aside, you only really have the one thread, right? So how are you supposed to treat the JavaScript main thread as your UI thread? You don't have anywhere else to put anything, right? Uh, so this gets hard, and we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, but I think this is like a, a very core concept that you need to keep in mind when you're designing your application. Because if, like, if single-threaded JavaScript wants to handle an input event, but you're, you're like an XHR just came back and you're, you're running your 300 milliseconds of data processing code or whatever, then unless you yield and there's no yield, so unless you do some like set timeout terrible thing, then you're never gonna get the touch event, right? I mean, you, you might get it 300 milliseconds later if the act timeout doesn't kick in. Um, but this, this is like a bad state to be in, right? So, you gotta think about it like this, which means I think 
In the future, I hope that we can move to a world where browsers are smart enough to prioritize JavaScript events a lot more successfully, but I don't really see us getting past the world of like cooperative multitasking, which is essentially what this is, right? In that like all of your various pieces of application code need to cooperate and not take too long blocking event handling, because if you block event handling, then high priority stuff, such as a, a touch input, doesn't get a chance to, to get processed. All right, so uh, a few things that we're trying to do to sort of untangle this unholy mess. Um, the first, this is, this is something that changed a, a while ago, maybe like a year ago or more in Chrome. Um, but there's repeating is that um, you, should, you should attach touch event listeners judiciously, which means essentially that um, there are times when you want touch events on some part of the page, right? And you can imagine lots of examples of this. Um, but there are times when you might attach an event listener somewhere that more for convenience. And I would say be wary of doing that because there are all the pitfalls we just talked about. So unless you really need touch events on that part of the page, maybe you don't need to put them there. Um, this, this comes up in this, this common pattern of like event delegation, right? Like everyone wants to put their event listeners on the document and then decide later kind of like what to do with them. But that means that all of this, like if, if you only needed that, that touch event listener for like one button in the corner, all of like the scrolling and stuff, like y you incur all of these downsides without a whole lot of upside because you could have just specified it on, on the, the one element that needed it. Um, so <coughs> there are, this is an, another off-discussed topic, um, there are these really painful like tap and, and scroll delays. Like I touched, I talked about the touch act timeout, but another one that should be very familiar is this like double tap timeout, right? So there are these fast click libraries that uh, essentially try to uh, get get around this. Um, we're moving past this, thankfully. And if you if you set a mobile viewport, which is like a width equals device width kind of a thing in your meta tag, then uh, as of Chrome 32, there there won't be this. 300 millisecond click delay. So that's good. Um, and I know this is like way underspecified. Um, I don't mean this talk to be particularly Chrome specific. This is just like stuff that has changed recently. So I feel the need to try to get the, the word out on. I'll talk about interop um, at the end of this section. Um, this is brand new. Um, there's this new CSS property called touch action that lets you more specifically declare what kind of touch events you're interested in on some region of the screen and what kind of touch events you're fine letting the browser do its default thing, for instance, scroll in response to. Um, I have a couple slides on this, so I'll talk about it in more detail. Um, uh, this one is subtle but important. Um, starting soon, we're going to start sending some touch events during the scroll. Right now, you get in Chrome, which is different from all the other browsers, which sucks, and that's why we're changing. Um, you get a touch cancel when scrolling starts, and then you don't get more events in the touch event string. Um, this is bad, this is not what you want, because you might want to implement some effect that's linked to the scroll, for instance, like this pull to refresh thing that I was talking about earlier. And so for that to work, you need to get these events. Um, we're gonna start sending the events, but you, it, unless your application expects them, you may get some undefined behavior. If you're re relying on that touch cancel event coming, um, not good. All of these are links to articles with a whole lot more detail. So I would encourage, I'll make the slides available, and I would encourage you to like read up on these in depth. Um, lastly, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier, you, you can't block the main thread, right? This means that you need to be very careful about the amount of JavaScript you run at a time without yielding. You need to be careful about sort of the expense of style recalculation or layout. Um, this is hard, but it is possible. Um, and lastly, I, I mentioned this, this, uh, this unfortunate thing about scroll events in that they get delivered asynchronously. Um, you, you can actually use the on-scroll events to reposition elements on the screen, um, but only if the app is like well behaved, right? So like 
for instance, in Chrome, we've started sending the on scroll event immediately before the request animation frame callback, and it'll be it'll have like accurate scroll positioning information, which means that you can use it as long as the main thread <laughs> is sort of jank free and you're not like backed up, right? If you get backed up, you get into the state where uh, you end up pipelined with respect to, to later stages that might be doing things like changing the scroll offset, and so everything will kind of fall apart. But if the app is well behaved, this actually does work. And I, I've got a demo that I think is pretty compelling um, showing this. So uh, this is just a sort of little anagif about um, those judicious touch events. Essentially, uh, the point of this slide is that DevTools has a way to visualize where on the screen you have touch event handlers. Um, it's under the rendering uh, menu. You can say show potential scroll bottlenecks, and that'll show you where it'll have like rectangles highlighting every region that has a touch event handler uh, set on it. Um, touch action, this is the new property I was talking about. Um, the, 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 the most interesting values of touch action, which is one part of the pointer event spec, um, and it's the part that is being implemented most quickly by most browsers. Microsoft has implemented the entire pointer event spec. Um, Chrome has now implemented touch action. Um, no word from Apple, um, so I'm not sure what they're doing. Um, the, the most interesting values here are, are the three at the bottom, I think. Um, pan X and Pan Y do about what you'd expect. Um, they let you specify that you only want to allow scrolling in one direction, and you only want touch events in the other direction. This provides like really nice disambiguation for the browser because it knows that it can immediately send you a touch event because it doesn't need to worry about scrolling in the, event, in the direction that you're handling. And it can immediately scroll because it doesn't need to worry about JavaScript receiving the touch event um, in, in the direction that it is supposed to. Um, and then touch action none is, is kind of better still. In, in the case where you don't want scrolling at all, like you'll do your positioning yourself, you'll do whatever you want to do, touch action none like we'll just immediately give you the touch events. And so this is kind of nice. But keep in mind that like then you don't get scrolling. <laughs> um, and so this, this has effects, and I, I wouldn't want people to misuse it. Um, some imagined use cases for this. Um, uh, I don't have a demo of touch action, unfortunately. Um, uh, for none, you, you, it's when you don't want scrolling, right, but you do want full control. Uh, the Pan X would be good for like a an image gallery that was like the size of the viewport and that went horizontally, but you wanted to be able to like flick things upwards, for instance. Um, pan Y would be great for like a swipe to dismiss in like a list, right? So you want to let the browser scroll as it normally would in the vertical direction, but in the horizontal direction, you want to do your custom swipe to dismiss thing. Um, this works really nicely, in my opinion. Um, to show just how far you can go, um, this, is, this is a video of a pull to refresh demo, uh, and the, the demo's up on GitHub, uh, courtesy uh, a guy named Tim Dresser. And uh, in the most recent versions of Chrome with this, this demo, it, it actually works pretty well. Again, pull to refresh is probably one of the most challenging UI effects to, to do today, because um, you need this combination of the native scrolling and the touch events like in the in the middle sort of because all of a sudden you need to know that oh I've hit the end and I I need to start like repositioning things because there's no way to like over scroll in uh, in Chrome and you can kind of do that in Safari um, by relying on like the rubber banding but like that's gonna feel probably a little crappy. Um, Anyway, so check out this demo. Um, like, look at the code. I think it's it's pretty compelling. Um, okay. Lastly, interop. So I've been talking a lot about Chrome specifically, but um, what about the rest of the browser landscape? Uh, this is an area that's unfortunately very very underspecified, but um, it is slowly getting more consistent. Um, for instance, there's the the touch events during scroll thing that I mentioned earlier, um, and that's a link to an article explaining exactly what is changing. Um, but we still are in this world where many different browsers behave pretty differently. And we're trying to make this more consistent, but this is an area, frankly, that could use a lot of input from web developers because 
it isn't always obvious like what the right thing to do is, and we're sort of stuck in this mess of compatibility hacks because there is a lot of content out there that, that sort of works a certain way and expects a lot of these weird quirks, and it's tough to break them. Um, so you can see that in, in like more recent versions of Chrome, we've tried to move as much in line with other browsers as possible, um, but we've made some tweaks like this block on overscroll thing because we think that's important to allow you to do custom scroll effects. Um, and you can see that like there are still outliers like IE10, which doesn't block it, scroll on anything, um, which means that the scrolling is really good. But if you want to customize it at all, you're, you're kind of hosed. Um, so anyway, uh, input from the community. Welcome. All right, part two. How do you get new pixels up on the screen as quickly as possible? Um, remember what I showed before about keeping all these stages in the browser's rendering pipeline under 16 milliseconds? Um, I'm going to talk about the, woo. Great. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the last few stages in that pipeline now. Um, if you're going to animate something, you, you have a choice about which CSS, an, which CSS properties to animate. There are a lot of animable properties, um, and you can, um, you can change many of them. In general, when considering something that's very performance sensitive like this, a good rule of thumb is that y if you can do less work, you're almost certainly better off that way, right? And so operations like transform and opacity that only require recomposites are generally much safer bets across all browsers um, than changing something like width, which will cause like a relayout of the content inside of that, that block. Um, this is unideal. I think we all want to get to a world where um, you can just animate whatever property you want and, and you can expect that um, it'll render reasonably fast. But unfortunately, that is not the world we're in today. Um, in particular, painting is really, really slow still. Um, and as a result, anything that requires repainting um, is very difficult to animate at 60 hertz on like a breadth of, of devices. Um, and like the worst case scenario is, is what we sort of affectionately refer to as a paint storm, which is when you're painting repeatedly during some interaction. Um, so this is the same, uh, the same example I showed at the beginning, but with another DevTools feature turned on called Show Paint Rectangles, which is also under the rendering menu. Um, it's something that's been there forever, but uh, a lot of people still don't know about. Um, and you can see where it's like flashing on the screen. Um, the, those flashes are, are where, what part of the screen got repainted that frame. And so if, if you're being very careful and you're only changing properties that require like recomposite, you won't see any flashes at all. Um, but if you're seeing flashes like every single frame, then probably you're in bad shape. And that's when it's very useful to get out the timeline view that um, was there earlier, uh, which is another DevTools feature, which will show you exactly what's happening. And like, for instance, one really bad pattern that, that I see come up sometimes is that people will set style uh, like, and then force like synchronous layout and then like go over and over and over again. Um, the same kind of thing can happen with painting, um, especially if you're doing this like every frame, for instance. Um, you're like reading some value or changing some value and then, and then uh, forcing it to change. So paint storms, not good. How do, you, how do you avoid paint storms? Well, the best we can sort of offer at the moment is, is using the same uh, sort of compositor techniques that um, the browser uses to scroll the page, which essentially means using these transform and opacity animations that I was talking about earlier. So if uh, these, this is like the translate Z0 hack, right? This is like terrible, but it's, it's what we got. Um, and you can essentially use these 3D transforms to put stuff forcibly into a layer, and then you can update the transform, and as you update the transform, nothing needs to repaint. So um, this is the same demo uh, and this link is a link to like the live version of it. Um, with paint recs still enabled, but now you'll notice that the only thing flashing is the scroll bar, um, which for some reason is being repainted. Um, but all those uh, sort of parallaxy elements on the screen that are flying in and out are doing so with transforms and they're not causing any repainting. So that is something at least. Um, 
the takeaway here is that you can you can find these kind of bad scenarios pretty easily with dev tools. Um, it's a little harder to figure out how to fix them, but you essentially want to use use the layer system um, if if at all possible. And um, there are going to be cases where things you see things repainting, like you see. Uh, paint racks flashing and it seems like they shouldn't because the pixels didn't actually change. If you see that, file a bug. Like there are a zillion of these in most browsers um, and like I'm sure the folks at Mozilla, et cetera, would also welcome them um, because all of this is just like extraneous work that the browser shouldn't be doing but is because it produces the right visual result but it's, it's not as fast as it could be. Okay, that's all kind of old hat. Um, what about new stuff? So <laughs> there is uh, this new CSS property called will change. Um, and the idea here in this context is that you can use will change to more meaningfully declare what parts of the page get layers and, and what don't. Um, this is sort of trying to get us out of this translate Z weirdness. Um, we've never had an explicit, I want this thing to be in a layer property. Uh, in, in CSS, and that's something we've sort of tried really hard to, to avoid because it's, it's an implementation detail, right? Um, but this will change basically allows you to, say, to, to specify ahead of time which CSS properties you intend to animate. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, on the next slide. Uh, next, I, I do want to brag briefly about some speed ups we've made to updating layer positions from JavaScript. Um, Remember I said there are, there are these composited only kind of CSS properties like transform and opacity, but if you're setting these from JavaScript with inline style, you still pay a style recalculation cost. And that style recalculation cost can be expensive um, because like at some point somewhere, the string you set needs to get parsed and applied to the DOM, right? Um, that's gotten a lot cheaper recently, so I'd, I'd encourage you to check out recent versions of Chrome and see, see how that's sped up if you've got any of this yourself um, going on in your projects. And uh, coming up next, uh, web animations is going to let this be even cheaper still because you can set up the animation timeline ahead of time and then just scrub the timeline. You don't have to do style recalculation at all. Um, I'll go into more detail about that too. So we'll change um, one instance of this is saying we'll change transform. Uh, you, can, you can stick any animable property in the value field of will change. Um, and this is essentially a hint to the engine saying, this is what I'm gonna change. You know, maybe you wanna do some work ahead of time to be ready for the moment when I change it. Um, so we'll change transform uh, would like pre-promote the element in question to its own layer because it's gonna get transformed, right? Um, this is a link to the spec, and uh, Chrome implemented this very recently, uh, like a month ago, and Mozilla is currently implementing it, but the, the, they haven't shipped it yet. Um, the web animations stuff I was talking about earlier, um, <coughs> this is really nice because it allows you to skip that style recalc step, and this is basically the cheapest way that you can update the position of something in response to both touch, of, like, touch move events and programmatically in request, like uh, procedurally, excuse me, in request animation frame. Um, this, this is really important if you wanna do something like say, uh, like a side drawer, because you wanna be able to like slide the side drawer out and have it stick to your finger, but then if you let go in the middle, you might want it to like smoothly animate back in. Um, you need to update both from the touch event handler and from like some animation loop that you're running yourself. You can essentially set up a timeline that has the entire drawer animation specified ahead of time, and then you can scrub that timeline in either case, right? And this allows you to have like a much more unified animation architecture. It's a lot nicer to author, um, and it's also a lot faster because you don't need to do any of the setting inline style stuff. Um, you can see that uh, the way this works is that you, you essentially get an animation player and then you can set the current time, which is like seeking in the animation timeline, um, elsewhere in JavaScript, for instance, in a touch move handler, and it just does what you'd expect. Um, you need to maybe convert from like uh, the geom geometric coordinates to like 
the time that that represents in the animation, but that's like eminently doable. And so I like this a lot. Um, Chrome has element.animate support in version 36 as well, so also very new. Um, both Safari and Firefox um, are implementing it, but haven't shipped it yet. <coughs> uh, lastly, uh, I said this talk. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Surface found. Source found. Great. Thanks. Um, I said this talk was going to be about sort of like smoothly responding to touch input, and so. I've focused on things relevant for there, uh, for like that case. Um, but it, it's worth pointing out that one of the benefits that having this compositor thread gives you is that you can run these declarative animations on that thread, which lets you cheat a little bit. Basically, you can set up an animation ahead of time, you can start that animation running, and you can do this with CSS animations, with CSS transitions, with web animations, as long as it's on a property that can be accelerated, which again, at this point, is like, transform opacity and filters. One could imagine that being a, a broader set in the future, but for now, this is what it is in basically all modern browsers. Um, and then you can, you can run this separate from JavaScript, and they will continue to update every frame, even if JavaScript like runs long, right? So now doing your expensive uh, data processing in your XHR response is not such a big deal because you can have some, say, loading animation that's consistently running. Um, this, is, this is really nice for being able to paper over uh, some of what would normally be like a bad hitch. Um, so I like that a lot too. Uh, lastly, a few kind of more random comments that I think are, are very relevant to trying to build a jank-free uh, mobile web app. Um, a few notes about the web view, the new web view that is based on Chrome. Um, Please use hardware acceleration. I, I see a lot of people turning it off because they found that it didn't work well a long time ago or something. Uh, the, the software mode is like not going to work, not going to work in a way that performs up to snuff for this kind of application. So please use that um, and watch the size of the DOM. Unlike in the browser, in the web view, um, for complicated reasons involving the the shape of the web view API. Um, a lot of viewporting optimization in the browser is totally precluded in the web view, which means that if the DOM is very, very long, all of a sudden, a lot of operations get really, really slow. Um, in, in like Chrome itself, we can just skip stuff that we know is very far from the viewport, but you can't do that in the web view because the, the embedding Android app may at any point synchronously ask for a bitmap of the entire page. Um, so everything needs to be painted all the time. Um, and that can be slow if the, if the page is very long. Um, and lastly, uh, the UI thread is shared with the native view UI thread, which means that if some Java in like your wrapper application is running on that UI thread and some JavaScript is trying to run, like these things can't happen at the same time, which means essentially if you have logic in both of these, you've, you've, you're splitting your frame budget between them. Um, so you can get into trouble that way. So just be careful. Uh, lastly, what's next? Uh, some things that are all, like on my radar that we're trying to do in Chrome. Um, we're we're trying to finally make painting faster, um, and there, I, don't, I don't I don't have anything very interesting to share about this at the moment. But um, this is something we're actively working on. Uh, we're trying to make the layer updates uh, like from JavaScript, setting inline style, even cheaper. Like there's the web animations trick that I talked about, but maybe you do want to do it just with inline style, and we're trying to make that cheaper still. Um, we think we can make a few more strides there. Um, and the DevTools timeline is getting an overhaul that I'm very excited about because it's going to show you a lot more detailed information. Right now, um, the timeline is a fantastic tool. I use it all the time. Um, but it, it, you, you kind of bottom out pretty quickly if you're trying to debug performance stuff. And so we're going to expose more information there. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to see how that goes. Uh, lastly, kind of like a, a meta comment, um, you, might, you might be thinking that Okay, uh, there are some examples of like things performing well, but this this seems like a very narrow path to be on, right? And you would be absolutely right; it is a very narrow path. We're trying to kind of forge ahead, but um, I I think probably one of the easiest ways to stay on that path is is to use like one of the better frameworks. And so I actually think that Polymer is a good option here because 
if nothing else, you can look at the, the Polymer implementation of a lot of the UI elements, and you can see like pretty solid examples of how to implement these specific types of components. Um, but beyond that, other resources to help you sort of identify that narrow path and, and stay on it. Um, Jankfree.org is a site I maintain with a couple other people, uh, which has just like a, a laundry list of articles and, and talks like this one um, if, you, if you're hungry for more. Um, the three links at the end are all like more detail about touch events um, that aren't linked from earlier in the talk. But like I said, like every one of those things I talked about has an article devoted to it, and there's a lot more content out there. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and take questions. Thank you very much. Anybody? All right. Easy. Thanks.